Hey everyone, welcome to the Onyx Debates. First one, uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, the best bird dog breed. Uh, we're going to give it a little bit of time here, let some people filter in. Uh, we've got some great guests with us today. It should be some sporting conversation. Uh, we're going to definitely try to keep it uh, between the navig navigational beacons here. We don't want to, uh, we're not trying to hurt any feelings by any means. So try to follow those rules in the chat to just keep it civil. Um, if you want to talk amongst yourselves, um, use the chat function. You look at the bottom of the screen, it'll say chat. We'd love to hear where everyone's from, what your favorite breed of dog is. Um, be sure to post that in the chat. And if you've got any questions for our panelists today, um, throw them in the Q&A uh, and we'll, we'll try to get to a handful of them. So uh, remember that your guys, your screens are off, so uh, we can't see you, we can't hear you. So um, don't worry about that. But again, um, I've seen some people rolling here. Just try to keep her, keep her between the lines. Obviously this is a, a hot button topic for a lot of people. So we're just, we're trying to, We'll keep it pretty civil, but we're going to have fun. Uh, we've got a, a great cast of characters with us today. So um, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and and give a, a little brief intro and we'll wait. We'll probably wait a few minutes. I still see a handful of people rolling in here. Um, so what with us today, we have Mr. Travis Frank of the Flush TV and podcast. Trav, how are you doing? Fantastic. Thanks for having me on tonight. Yes, and I'm just uh, on the next to my screen is Mr. Greg Blair uh, of Purina. How you doing? Thanks for inviting me. Looking forward oh, yeah. to it. Should be fun. Uh, I've got Josh Miller of Riverstone Kennel here to represent. Oh, Josh can represent both sides, so that's fun. Yeah, we'll hit both sides of the fence here. I'm uh, I, I'm loving all the uh, the labs rule you know comments. These uh, <laughs> I might just stay for these comments that are gonna roll in here. But uh, but yeah, I do have that uh, that pointing dog background, having field trialed for a number of years. So um, yeah, I can I can hit both sides of the fence. But I will uh, I will you know stick it out for the Labradors here. Yeah, and then last but not least, Mr. Ron Baim, representing the we're the wide world of versatile dogs exactly <laughs> exactly uh the hunting dog podcast behind the dog the upland institute all those things yes yes <laughs> so well, needless to say we have an absolute wealth of knowledge on here today uh and we're gonna have fun getting into some some topics that uh i am looking forward to personally hearing how they go down so um We'll just kind of kick things off again for people that are just joining. Remember, your screens are off. We can't hear you. Um, if you want to ask us questions, be sure to use the Q&A, uh, the Q&A function. If you want to chat, uh, use the chat function. Uh, so uh, you you heard our panelists. What I'm going to do is we're just going to kind of give a, a few minute uh, breakdown on who everyone is, and then we'll kind of kick it off. So Travis, you want to start and give us a little intro about uh who you are, and also uh, what your favorite breed of dog is. Ooh. <clears throat> okay, so, yep, Travis Frank from the Flush Television Show and Podcasts, and I have been producing Upland bird hunting television shows, coming uh, closing in on almost a decade now. And when you asked me to jump on here, Ben, I think you mentioned that I maybe uh, would be a good voice for this because of the variety of dogs that I've hunted behind. When we're out in the field, we hunt behind a lot of people all over the country in different places. And I have just witnessed a lot of dog breeds over the years. And I've come to uh, see a few that continue to stand out over time. Um, and I, I can't give you an exact, do I have to pick a breed right now? Yes. Yes. Right. <laughs> well, yes. My, mine, I guess, is is a, a mutt. <laughs> she is. A, oh, oh. <laughs> well, maybe a mutt's not a fair word, but she's a she's a mixed breed with the German short hair pointer mixed with an English setter. And I I'm really, really torn between German short hair pointers, setters and 
English pointers or pointers. And the reason why is because I love a dog that just gets out there and covers a lot of ground. I love watching a dog that is so determined to find that bird that, you know, a mile isn't too far. I, I don't want him to go a mile all the time, but I You've love had a dog that did that. So I've had it. Yeah. I've, I've maxed out my GPS more than once with my dog, but I, I really love a dog that hunts with purpose and just has that drive to go out there and find those birds. So I don't have to. And when you see a dog that's well-trained um, I I've just seen that so many times in the, in the pointing breeds that it's hard for me to, to choose a dog that doesn't have that. So, and, and Travis's dog, Daisy, is what you would call a poinsettia. A poinsettia. Yes, that's her nickname. English. Yep. <laughs> German short hair pointer mixed with a setter. So there it is, a poinsettia. Love it. Yeah. Well, very cool. So next, Greg, Mr. Greg Blair, what uh, what's a little yes, background and your favorite breed of dog? Well, my background is um, I'm the area manager for Brina Pro Plan. So in the bird dog segment, so kind of like Travis, I've... I've seen everything from the wire hairs to the Britneys to the Vizlas to the red setters, Irish setters, pointer setters, short hairs. Um, my position is we sponsor all their events. So I am fortunate enough to go see them all. And um, you see the walking game, you see the horseback game, you see the AKC side, you see the American field side. So you name it, I've seen it. Um, so, I mean, and I've done, I've been with Perina for eight years now. I've had pointing dogs since 98, so 25 years. Um, when I hunted behind my buddy's dad's wire hair for the first time, I knew I had to have a pointing dog. Um, that being said, my first pointing dog was a short hair. And, um, but I can honestly say, I said it before, my favorite dog is a good one, but I would have to go with an English pointer. I just put down a lifetime dog. It was an English setter, you know, a multiple national champion. And I think Ben can say, if you see a setter in the grouse woods, there's nothing better, but all around pointing dog. Um, and we might get into it later for certain things might be different, but I'll take the English pointers style, drive, intensity, and, and they can do it all from the Dakotas to the Georgia piney woods. So I'll go with the English pointer. Awesome. Josh, what do you got? Uh, well, so, uh, so my background kind of comes a little differently. So, um, you know, a lot of you guys will talk about, you know, family that, that you had that got you into dogs. Uh, my family was not a dog family. Uh, matter of fact, we had two dogs growing up and probably the most impressive thing that they could do was catch a potato chip out of the air, you know, when we, when we threw it to them off the table. So it, uh, I wasn't grown up into, uh, into bird dogs or gun dogs, uh, but I was a duck hunter. And so I just, I don't know why, but I just got infatuated with watching ducks and listening to them and how they communicate. And, uh, so my dad really wasn't a duck hunter and you know, my family wasn't duck hunters. So I needed someone to duck hunt with. And so I got my first hunting dog and, and I don't have the personality to do something and just dip my toe into it. And so I read every book and watched every DVD and trained him to the best of my ability. Um, you know, long story short, I met a guy in a, a sportsman's warehouse and I was just in the dog aisle. I was 16 years old. I had just got my driver's license. And he was the uh, the secretary for the local retriever club. And he invited me down to you know, one of their training days. And so I had no idea this dog's name was Easton. Um, I had no idea the level that I had him trained with until all of a sudden you have a comparison. You're like, oh my gosh, he is pretty dang good. And so um, we went and we competed. You know, we, we started field trial, we hunt tested. He was very successful, which got me excited about it. So that took me down the, uh, the path retrievers. I trained under a number of different guys. And then uh, we were actually at a retriever trial and I started talking to my mentor uh, about pointing dogs because I have loved pointing dogs. And I don't, I don't care if you're a retriever guy or, or a pointer guy, when you see a little pointer puppy point to butterfly or point to wing in a yard at eight weeks old, there is nothing cooler than that. And the, to me, the thing that's so cool about it is that that just screams to you how important genetics are. There's no reason that puppy has no idea why they're stopping and pointing that, that butterfly, but they just know something inside of them is telling them that, that they're supposed to, right? 
And so I was talking to him about this and he told me, he goes, Josh, you'll never see a retriever guy go be successful uh, in pointing dogs. They're two very different animals. And although he was right, I, uh, I took that as a challenge and uh, got a, a setter uh, that I named Ranger. He was out of Shadow Oak Bow. And uh, if you're a setter guy, especially, you know, bow. And uh, I got a horse and I borrowed a trailer and we would drive to a trial and I would shovel the horse droppings out of the back. We'd put up a cot and Ranger and I would, would either freeze at night or sweat to death at night and we'd run our trials. And that's how we started. And uh, he was fortunately very successful. And the next year I had four horses and was running 12 dogs and everything from short hairs to pointers to setters and everything in between. And, uh, and that was supposed to be my fun time. So my retriever stuff was my work and my, my, uh, my pointer stuff was supposed to be fun, but it got to be more than that. And so at some point, you just got to say, Hey, this is going two two different ways. What do you got to do? So at the end of the day, uh, I'm a Labrador guy. I currently breed uh, British Labs. I do have a reason I'll bore you guys with that. Cause it's a big, uh, it's a big long story of going overseas and finding my why there. But uh, but you know I'm a duck hunter. You know first and foremost, you know we do up and hunt. You know with our our retrievers. But uh, but being a retriever guy, you know you have to have the dog that fits what your needs are. Um, I love Ranger. I still own him today. I think he's 10 or 11 now. Um, but Ranger, my setter doesn't do me a whole lot of good in uh, the flooded timber of Arkansas. So, uh, so that's where my Labradors come in. So your favorite dog is is it's a Labrador, Labrador. Oh. <laughs> You're going to make me say it. <laughs> yes. Yes, I am. Yep. But I will say, I've always said, Greg took the, the words out of my mouth. I've always said a good one when anybody asked me that question, because that is the truth. Even if you're prejudiced towards a breed, if you see a good one, you're going to like it. That's just the way it is. Amen to that. Yeah. You should have given a little love to that setter though. That got you started here. Yeah. Yeah. Ranger was special, man. He, uh, I remember, uh, I remember the first trial that he won and I thought that, that it was like the best thing ever. And I had no idea. He, uh, I think he won in his three-year-old year, he won nine field trials. That's one, not place in one, nine in one year. And I was pretty, uh, pretty ecstatic about that little dog. And, um, yeah, he, he's, he's one of the reasons that I'm sitting here talking to you guys here today, because he gave me that versatility of being able to see it all. You know, I, I think that I can, I can now honestly speak and see both sides of it. You know, you see so many times that someone is so keyed, keyed in on say Labradors, it's labs, labs, labs. Well, unless you've actually been to the other side, you don't know your why, right? So why labs or why, why wouldn't you like you know, another dog? Because I've seen a lot of dogs that I had originally didn't know if I liked that breed, but I saw a good one and made me fall in love with them. Yeah. Super good insight. That's yeah. Very true. Um, all right. So the, I'll introduce you better this time, Ron, I'll say like the godfather of hunting dog podcasts. How about that? Thank you. Thank there you. you go. Um, yeah, my start was actually with the German short hair pointer. I then became a judge for NAVDA North American versatile hunting dog association. So I have judged every pointing breed that's, registrable in NAVDA unless there's been one in the last 12 months that I haven't heard about and to everybody's point I've seen some excellent specimens of every breed I've seen less in some but I've seen excellence in all um, but to tell you my favorite breed is does not reside in my kennel and it's a German wire hair now they're not all my favorite, they're all not all German wire hairs are my favorite dogs, but I had one in particular that was, that could literally do it all. And I've always said that if I had one dog and it was a certain situation, it would be a German wire hair. Very good. We're, we're kind of all over the board. I like it. Should make for interesting conversation. Um, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to I'm going to pose a series of questions, one question at a time, and I'll ask you guys if if you want to. I'll probably start with somebody, and then if you guys want to chime in uh, on the panel here, just raise your hand and and you can offer your insight uh, why either you think somebody is wrong or you think they're right. So uh, it should be interesting. So we're going to kick it off. Um, first question would be. Uh, if you were to pick a bird dog for a first time hunter, what would it be? 
And Ron, I'll just kick it right over to you because you finished up. We'll go in reverse order. Um, first, I, I get that through the podcast. I get those emails a lot. <clears throat> and I've always leaned toward a dog that probably doesn't have a lot more, a, a lot of challenges. Like a, a, I never recommend a super high desired dog to a first time dog owner because it could be a little overwhelming. Um, but I, I kind of stayed in the middle of the road because there's so many German short hair pointers in this country. If you do your research, I think that'd be a first, first good dog for a first time handler for a couple reasons. There's, there's a lot of people in that, in those clubs, in those hunt test situations. I think you could get a lot of support. Um, you got to do a lot of work and you have to do a lot of research on breeders. But it's just a, I think it's a solid all around dog for a first time dog owner. And I think a first time dog owner can't go into it with a lot of caveats like, well, I've got three kids under five. Uh, my wife's allergic and I only hunt two times a year. I'm just saying, in general, you could look for a German short hair pointer and probably find what you're looking for. What if I added, like, I mean, what about in terms of, you know, a lot, a lot of people, they're, they're house dogs, right? Yeah. I, I had short hairs growing up. And personally, I think they're one of the worst house dogs. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you said first time hunting dog. Yeah. So, <laughs> but I, I would agree with you because there are so many. And I think I, I will spank some breeders on the ass for, only looking for desire and not looking for cooperation in a dog, I could give people a short list of German short hair breeders that would fit that bill. But to your point, there's, because there's so many, a lot of people just breed this high power dog to a high power dog and forget about, I, and I don't know how everybody else feels to me, cooperation in the dog, which is the natural part of the dog <clears throat> that, he gives himself to you. Cooperation is to me, the hallmark of a good dog for what I do. Yeah. Very good. Anyone want to follow that up with their, their suggestion and why it might be different? Travis. I'll go. Yeah, I'll go. I, I think there's a reason that the lab is, you know, for the last 30 years, the most popular dog in the united states i mean there's so many hunters that spend if we're being honest there's a lot of hunters that spend less than 10 days a year in the field hunting but they have a dog for 365 days a year the labs are just they love everybody in the family you can do so much with them you can hunt everything with them um it might not be ideal and you know the vast prairie of montana but it can still find birds for you out there too you can duck hunt with it you can do everything with it um you know and you know i can speak to having what you said ben i <laughs> mean my the neurotic side of my dog and the fact that she wants to she's sitting here right now going crazy because she's staring out you know at some rabbits outside and she just wants them so bad it's like she just has this motor to go where not saying that labs don't because so many of them do, but I just think their, their demeanor from what I've seen is lends itself to a little bit uh, easier getting into it. So um, it's, it wasn't my choice, but if you're saying if somebody wants to get their first dog, uh, there were a lot of challenges that I ran up against having this high powered Ferrari and um I I think a different motor might be the way to go. Ron's got his hand up. Well um I, I oh and so did Greg, but I just this is yeah. really quick. I did want to go into a little detail on Travis's first dog. Is it true that on your handheld device with Daisy you got a warning that said your dog restrict it went into restricted airspace? <laughs> i don't know I'm, it cuts out uh, it cut out more than one time i took her i took her in into places where she could go for a long distance right. before we got rumor. into danger yeah, yeah it was but just a rumor i heard when i brought her home she ran 
and uh you know my my kids bless them tried to take her outside and they couldn't hold on to her long enough as she's dragging them through the yard on their on my son's holding on for dear life and finally he lets go and she went across multiple highways um almost made it to ben's house and then but she loves <laughs> she loves people so much that eventually they see a dog with a rope and they 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 say well that doesn't seem right and then they call me and come pick me up yeah so greg i saw what were you i saw you pop up yeah no i'm gonna have to i hate to say this but i'm gonna have to agree with ron and uh maybe disagree with travis but i too think the short hair first of all you might want to go back to that new that person what does he want to do with her is she what to do with it you know luckily for me i had exposure to a flushing dog retriever and then a, a pointer and so i knew which one i wanted to get which side of the fence i wanted to be on and i can't agree anymore to the short hair because i thought about that today you know they can they can do water work they can retrieve, they'll point, they'll, you know, and I had a great one in the house. So for a first time pointing dog guy, the short hair by far to me, you know, it didn't have a sharpness to some of the breeds that might. It wasn't like the runoff pointers that people think are runoffs. The short hair was, I don't know, I won't call him a Cadillac, but it was like a push button for me to get started into the pointing dog segment. Yeah. And, you know, from there, I was exposed to so many more pointing dogs. But if you don't know what you want, like Travis said, yeah, the most popular are the labs and probably the best house dogs are the labs. But if you want to, you know, go hunt sharp tails or if you want to go, you know, run grouse, yeah, they can do it. But you might want to try a pointer. I mean, hmm. so yeah, I want to decide I, what you want. Yeah, I think, you know, on that too, I honestly, I tell people, jump in i mean if you want to get a dog and you're serious about training and understanding the dog then you know the things that i learned by having a hard-headed stubborn dog that wanted to get out and run like i have been able to help so many other people by just my experiences and now i feel you know the next dog that i get i I can't imagine I'm going to get another one as tough as that one. And that's just her. That's not, I'm not labeling a breed here. That's that particular dog. But I, I'm grateful that I had one that really pushed me to the limits right away. And, you know, so jump right in because you're going to be better off for the rest of your life. Once you've gone through the trials. Josh, I saw you had your hand up. Yeah, so I, I'm going to twist this a little bit because, um, yeah, I, I think so many people are passionate about their breed of choice, mainly because they just got the one that worked for them, right? Because I think you can take any breed. Okay, so we've talked about the short hairs. I mean, I, I've had short hairs that are love bugs that want to be at my side all the time. And then I have I have trained short hairs that when they heard the thank you at the end of the trial kicked it, kicked it in another gear. And I had that, my horse going as fast as he could to catch up with that, that horse, that dog. So like for the labs, you can get with a breeder that is breeding these really, really hot dogs and not get a Labrador that everyone here is talking about as far as, you know, that dog is a great house dog and a great companion, great everything else. So I think the first thing is you need to be honest with yourself of who you are and what you want. Right. And sometimes we, as guys, this is a tough thing for us to, to do, right? So if I am at a stage in my life where I've got two young kids like I have right now, and I don't get to hunt nearly as much as I used to, I'm going to hunt six to 10 days a year. Like I may have to put my ego aside and say, what's best for my family right now? It's not going to be that fire breather, no matter what breed it is, right? It's going to be a dog. So I need to get with a breeder that is understanding what it is that I'm looking for and get the right dog for me. So for me, I, I always tell people, look at what you're going to do with the dog. So if, if you're a waterfall hunter, like I, I just don't think, you know, we're talking short hairs, we're talking like get a lap, get a, get a golden retriever, get a chest, get something that is, is geared to that game first off, that's all you're going to do. Okay. If you're going to do both. Okay. And I will start talking about short hairs and let's talk about dogs that can be versatile in it. If you're just going to hunt upland, maybe let's just talk about a pointing dog. Right. But the first thing is first, you need to know who you are and say, this is what I truly need. When people get into trouble, it's when they start doing things that they shouldn't be doing. So like for me, I'm going to pick on Ron a little bit with the wire hairs. 
only because Ron, I have seen more people recently be upset with their purchase of a wire hair. And the reason is, it's not the dog's fault. It's because they were Labrador owners that they got a wire hair for the reason of, I wanted something different, right? Like all my friends have, have labs and wanted something different. Like that's the reason to get a, a different color truck, not a, a breed of a dog, right? If this is the right breed for you, let's stick with that, right? Now let's just find the right dog for you. And so the, to me, this all comes down to who are you? What do you need? Be honest with yourself and then find the right breed and breeder, which is probably more important, right? Breeder to get the dog that you're wanting because everybody I'm watching some of these comments of everyone's like, why wouldn't you want this dog? This is the best dog. Like that's the, that's because that breed and that breeder you got that dog from is the right fit for you. Right. And that, that's what it comes down to. And it's great. Everybody should love their dog. Yeah. hundred, hundred percent. Definitely. Um, before we switch topics, great. Anyone have any, Anything else to expound on that? Ron's got his hand up. He always Ron, has to talk. His Ron, hand has you ever been up the whole time. His hand's been up the whole time. <laughs> oh, let me, let, me, let me hit that off there. Oh, good. There hey, we go. Ben, I, I think we're probably going to get to this, but, um, you know, the, the importance of what Josh said there is the most important thing. You, just getting a dog just to get a dog, um, what are you going to do with it? what specifically are you going to hunt with it and where are you going to hunt with it that to me is is really such a huge factor in the type of dog yeah oh 100 percent, definitely that is true um so i'm gonna throw out a divisive statement this is coming from me this is this is not coming from onyx's point of view at all but um and i want to hear your feedback on it so for me, I think there should only be maybe four or five types of pointing dogs that you should ever get. Probably four. You're up to four now? I thought there were only three before. No, there I forgot one. Oh. Pointers, setters, Britneys, and then maybe throw in a, a versatile dog. Other than that, I don't think there should be, I don't think you should buy anything else. I would love to hear your feedback on if you think that is stupid or you agree with it. Okay, I'll go. I think that's stupid because they all have to eat and I need a job. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, so many people, because those are the ones that are out there. I was watching some of the comments when we started. Um, there's a lot of people with breeds that are not so, you know, as common, you know, the poodle pointer, the small Munsterlander, And again, Ron, the wire haired Vizla. Um, again, like Josh had said, it's like, what do you want to do with it? And then I guess you need to find the right people to be around. Is it a club? Go check them out. Um, now, when you get into the wire yeah. pools or the small monster landers or the poodle pointers, the gene pool is so much, so much, so much smaller than the ones you mentioned, Ben, the pointers, the setters, the Britneys, the short hairs. You can go online and, and we all go online and search out of those four breeds. I guarantee you in the next 15 minutes, you can find the top 10 kennels of all four of those and in a heartbeat, get a good puppy. Now, the small Munsterlanders will be tougher. The Poodle Boyers will be tougher. You might need to call someone like Travis or myself that has seen though. It's going to be tougher to find it. So I don't agree with your comment that there's only four. There's a lot more out there, but it takes a lot more work to get a good one. And by mean, I mean, you want a good one that'll be a good house dog. It's not neurotic. That has a good breeding history with a kennel. You know, you need to do your homework and not just jump in because I saw them on the cover of Pointing Dog Journal and they're the next thing since sliced bread. And then 101 Dalmatians come out and you're going to go buy a Dalmatian, you know? So do your homework. Um, but those are probably the easier ones to find some good puppies in. So it'd probably be easier for a first time buyer to go find one of those, but there's a lot of good ones out there. Yeah. And I guess mine was just directed. It was a blanket statement. It doesn't matter if it's your first or your last one. Right. Um, so I don't know, Travis or Ron, do you have any thoughts on that or Josh? Well, I I've seen a lot of, other pointers like uh, a German wire. I fell in love with one out in Nevada one time and I swore that was going to be my dog. 
And I even looked into the same breeder. I mean, that dog did uh, exactly what I wanted out of this big ranging dog that I currently have. Um, some Gordon setters that I've hunted with before that got out there and, and found the birds. So I've seen some of those other breeds that you're um, you're not talking about, Ben, do really well out there. So much of it, I think, um, and I will contradict myself here, but so much of it is the, the owner getting that dog out there if they're well-trained and have a good foundation. And then the birds, the birds obviously make that dog. Um, but to contradict that, a couple of the breeds that you picked, Ben, um, and here's here's the interesting thing that I, I always see uh, that I think a lot of hunters might not in that um, when a lot of hunters go out, they might have a buddy that they hunt with and that buddy might even have a dog out of the same litter, you know, and so they don't get to see what a dog of a different breed will be doing out there in comparison to their own. And so if I see a pointer, an English pointer out there running with a, a Brittany or something, let's say those two dogs, I can't argue with the fact that that English pointer is finding 90% of the birds is just out there. This is a machine out there. So if I did the math and I added it up, yeah, I, I think that that pointer at the end of the day finds more birds than some of these other dogs. It's just that most people don't have the comparison in the field together to be able to have that legit comparison to make. And so, yeah, some of those main breeds that you're talking about, Ben, they're lethal out there. They're, they're, you know, really, really good hunters, but I, I've still seen some of the other breeds, even poodle pointers um, that do a really good job too. Yeah, I'd like to jump in and talk uh, a little bit more on what Greg had mentioned because he's spot on with it as far as you know, with with those main breeds you're talking about, Ben, and the pointing dog side of it. There's more of them to choose from, so you're going to find more good ones, right? It's the same thing for us in the labs. You know, we get asked all the time, why didn't you see as many good chocolates as you see good blacks and good yellows? And it's quite frankly because there's not as many chocolates as there are blacks and yellows. It's probably one of the biggest things, right? Um but I'll, I'll play devil's advocate on this too. I also think you will find just as many poor dogs out of those popular breeds. So I'm, I'll stick with the lab since that's my world. I mean, I could probably walk outside, hit a golf ball and probably hit a Labrador breeder, a Labrador breeder. Right. And so you're, you all of these, you know, like, you know, Travis had mentioned earlier, Labradors are the number one most popular breeding because everybody loves their dog Everybody thinks that these dogs have to have puppies, which means that there's a lot of these dogs out there. And this is where all of this is so for interpretation, right? So my definition of a great dog is going to be different than everybody on here. It's going to be different than everybody listening, right? So when people are breeding these dogs just to produce dogs, like they're, to me, what I'm looking for in a Labrador and what makes a Labrador great, there are probably a thousand times that out there of what I think would be a non-desirable Labrador or a poor Labrador, right? So just so a Labrador being the most popular breed, I think you could find a, a really good one really easily with doing your research, but I think you could find a really bad one probably that much more easily, right? So there, you know, there's both sides of the fence on that. And that's where it, it comes back to breeders. Finding the right breeder is so critically important. And that's why some of these smaller breeds, like, you know, like the Poodle Pointers, like they're just such few people breeding them that I feel like the, the, the breeders that I've had contacts with, that they are doing it maybe even a better job because they have to be more detailed in what they're doing, right? There's there's not this mass production of them out there. And so, you know, there's so much that goes into it with health testing. And, and I mean, like I talked about early on in this, I mean, the money that I have to, to cut and or maybe we didn't talk, maybe this is beforehand. Uh, maybe, you know, Ron and I were talking about this, but like when I take a dog, it's like, you don't make the cut when you start looking at the financial loss and then the emotional loss of saying you don't make the team. So I have to place you with a forever home. You're going to have a great home for, it, but you can't like that. That's not an easy decision. And I'm a firm believer that most breeders are breeding the dogs that they're breeding, frankly, because those are the dogs that they have. 
Like they're not truly going out there and trying to get the best of the best of the best to come in and breed with them. So I, I just think you got to be careful with that. I mean, just simply uh, a search to try to find, you know, some dogs can land you in a great situation or the exact opposite. So you just got to be careful with that. I think there's some validity to that too, Josh. A friend of mine just picked up a poodle pointer two weeks ago and the amount of work that went into that, just him with the breeder, um, I was really impressed by it and all the research and, and the requirements of what he has to do with that puppy and the testing and everything. I have another friend that just drove across the border uh, into South Dakota and picked up a lab and he has no idea the, the history of it, none at all gets home that lab has zero desire to hunt i don't even know if he really got out and hunted this past fall but that's to your point they there are so many labs out there that you have no idea what what kind of genetics there are sometimes um, they're easy to get i don't know that a poodle pointer breeder is is nearly as easy to find don't you think too that kind of is separated by you know if you're a first-time dog owner and you want to go grab that lab across the border, you're going to jump into it. If, if you're in the second or third time, okay, I, I know a little bit of now more about the pointers. I know the LHU lines. I know who's breeding the Aaron's or the Miller's. So you're more looking at which one. And just like Josh said, in the pointer world, I mean, you can pick a litter and one might be decent. There's going to be duds and there's going to be good ones. But that first time pointing dog or even bird dog owner, is so excited about going and getting one. I don't think they have the knowledge of what's good and or not good. I mean, what's the different levels of dogs that are out there? Uh, and and it's, I think it's in every breed. I mean, the pointers are just not as big as the labs, but I mean, shoot, I mean, there's so many different lines and different styles. I mean, if you get a Rockacre Blackhawk dog versus an Elhu dog versus a Miller versus an Aaron's, Every single one of those four that I said, hunt different, run different, look different. And if you're a first time guy, you're looking at an eight week old puppy, you're just going to reach your hand in and grab the cute one. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it is tough. Well, and don't you think, Greg, that that's one of the reasons that so many people will say that their best dog that they've ever had is the one that they currently have. Is right. because that first dog taught them so much that they applied into the second dog, that they applied into the third mm -hmm. dog. It's just amazing how these dogs teach us what it is we're looking for and we can upgrade from there. Yeah. And two, to your point, Josh, earlier is if you've got an idea of a breed that you want, reach out to people, find somebody to talk to. And um, there's going to be litters every week posted online. So don't jump at that first one, but, um, you know, get some knowledge behind them because they can tell you if they're sharp or if they're, you know, the tail sets are this or their eyes are bad or if they're prone to cancer or if they're deafness or what, you know, EIC or whatever it may be in the breeds. Find the person that you trust or reach out to one of us or find a, find a NABDA club like Ron would know, you know, and seek out the knowledge first because they are a lifetime. They're a commitment for 10 to 15 years. Ron, do you have any, you got anything to chime in? No, I just wanted to see if you could come up with another ridiculous statement like that. Well, you haven't said anything, so do you agree with me? Uh, no, no, I don't. No, I don't. But to Greg's point and Josh's point, I have told so many people this that write me, that if you found a breeder down the street and you wanted a, if you wanted a small monster lander, you might have a Brittany breeder that's 10 miles away from you. Didn't know, but if you met that breeder and he, and, and good breeders will take you under their wing because they want their dogs to do good. You should almost just say, I'm not buying a Chevy. I'm buying a Dodge. Okay. If you got that support from a breeder, whether he wants you to trial it or wants you to test it, or is just like, I tell people, and I, and this is the truth. I tell people, if you can fall in love with your breeder, you're going to fall in love with your breed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, 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 Ron, that's a great point. You know, and, and just, uh, I guess a, a word of caution to people that are out there and might be looking at getting their first puppy. You know, when you call these breeders, 
especially that first time, if you don't know them, you don't have a relationship with them, you start asking questions, right? If your breeder doesn't ask you questions back, that's right. usually a red flag. I mean, if that breeder cares, that breeder should be asking questions to one, place you with the right puppy, but two, to make sure that the, that the puppy, that they should have a lot of pride in producing if they've done, if they truly believe they're bettering the right. breed and they're proud of it, they want to have that puppy go succeed, you know? So they should be asking yep. you, they should be interviewing you just as much as you're interviewing them. Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, Ron, as you use the Chevy Ford Dodge analysis. My dad, when I was looking for a used car, I always jumped at the first one I saw in the newspaper and the classifieds. This is the best one. This is what he goes, well, if you think the first one that you looked at is the best one, how about you wait a day and find a couple other best ones? You know, it's just like that in the puppy world. If you're going to jump at that first litter that you see, pump the brakes, think about it. There's going to be a new shiny button that's going to come out tomorrow. So, yep. um, yeah, it just it takes time and it takes a lot of some good research. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I heard it a number of times on here, but I think that's the most important thing is just going out and yeah, seeing dogs, researching, right? Because to Travis's point, yeah, you don't know. Like, I've never seen a Dodge before. All of a sudden I see it. It's like, oh, I really like this one. But without seeing it, you have no idea, right? Um, like the first time I hunted with a pointer, it was like, whoa, this is really different, right? Like, this is, like, I, I have draughts too. Love them. But then I hunted with a pointer and it was like, man, this is like a different dog. Mm -hmm. and so yeah you don't you don't know what you don't know so yeah. sometimes it's like you have in your mind what you think a pointer is going to be like in a good bad or ugly and if you could when you said whoa you didn't say if that was a good whoa or a bad whoa so go see them go see what they can do and then go from there yeah um so well, we're, we're going to kind of come around full circle here, but if you were going to say, I am, I'm a bird hunter, whether that's grouse, pheasants, quail, what have you, if you're picking a breed based off of pure performance, what would you pick? Why are we excluding waterfowl in this? Well, because we're talking bird hunting. <laughs> well, you bird bird upland, upland bird hunting. Up I just so left out you're right in here josh <laughs> that's tough because i think you need it's almost like you need a couple of them i mean you love to hunt i love to hunt pheasants but i also love to hunt sharp tails and I, i'll be totally honest with you i got waxed when i went with a buddy with a small monster lander and pheasants and he could go in the sloughs and on my pointer still up there ranging those hilltops looking for sharpens so if i'm going to go hunt pheasants and the Dakotas, I might want to lap. If, but if I'm a pointing dog guy, pure, pure, pure and through and through, I might want the wire hair or the short hair. So it's it's a tough one. And maybe maybe a better question is what would if you could pick two breeds, what would it be? Right? Mm. From a pure performance standpoint. Because uh, that's a I'll tell you. We, do this? we should probably do this like a quick fire answer like you get two breeds no yeah. explanation right. just two breeds all right i'll take i'll take a springer or a cocker so i can hit the cattail sloughs and i'll take uh, i'm not even going to go i'll, I'll go back to my german wire hair pointer because i i hate to lose i i hate to lose game and i have never seen a dog in my life that was more dedicated to finding something that was crippled. Now it's just, you know, that's only, an ex I've only had 23 dogs in my life. That's not a lot of data, but I've never had, that's, that's tongue in cheek. Okay. And I've never had a dog that was more obsessed with the recovery of game than a German wire or pointer. So I'll take a wire hair and I'll jump to the cocker, even though it's not meant for, for cattails but all right everybody two dogs quick let's let's put a time on this two dogs pointer third here oh there you go labrador setter 
Travis, you got two together, so you get two. Three. <laughs> <laughs> I've already got it, guys. I've already got it. I just have to braid. You have to braid them together. I don't know what's so difficult about this conversation. <laughs> I'm going. I'm going pointer short here. Okay. And come on, Me? man. You got to pick a side. Uh, I'd probably say pointer draw. There you go. And we won't get into the debate, Ron, if if they're the same thing because they are yeah. different. Now we we should get into that <laughs> only because you're wrong. Here we go. The gloves are again, off. I hate, I hate right. to agree with Ron again, but man, a good, well-bred cocker mm -hmm. running with a pointer yeah, or man. swapping up, you can't beat it. I almost yeah. went that route too, because that's just a beautiful combination. It, it really is. Mm -hmm. The thing is, like when it comes to cattails, I I hate cattails. It's the last thing I want to do is walk through cattails. So, right. part of me says, I want a dog that's just going to go in there and flush them out, you know. And yeah. but then I just say, maybe I just go to a property that doesn't have cattails. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't have birds. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, it doesn't have any pheasants on it. <laughs> I'll go hunt for grouse. That's fine. I mean, the cocker and the cattails a little bit, but you put them in the grouse woods. You can take them quail hunting with you. Yeah. They can sleep in right on the council of your truck with you. I mean, they're great truck dogs. Yeah, they are. They are. They are sweeties. I love them. So we're, you know, we're getting a number of questions. I guess, you know, bird dogs, I think of as bird hunting duck hunting, duck dogs, I think of duck hunting, but we'll go there. We'll go to the waterfall side. And thank you for everyone that changed Ben's mind on that. I watched the, the waterfall comments coming in and had a smile. <laughs> Ducks are <laughs> birds. Oh, Ducks are birds too. <laughs> there's duck dogs and then there's bird dogs. And I know a duck is a bird, but <laughs> uh, so I, this could be a very this could be a very uh, short session, but let's do the same thing rapid fire on if you had a waterfall dog, what would it be? Two Labradors. A lab and a wire hair or draw it, whatever you want to call it. Easy, pal. Okay, I'll take the wire hair then. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I it, I, I've never owned a lab, but I can't imagine that there would be a better duck dog. I just can't imagine. Agreed. Yeah. Every lab that I've ever duck hunted with has been awesome. So I, I go lab and then I still fell in love with that wire hair. So if I have to choose a second, I'm going to, I'm going to go back to that wire hair too. Cause I know that dog will go out and get it. <laughs> you know, so when it, when it comes to, you know, obviously the waterfall, it's, it's seeming like the lab is king and, you know, you hear different things is in, and Josh, maybe you can speak to this, Ron, um, you, you know, what are the, why is the, why is the, the lab king compared to you take a wire hair, a draught, a cock or whatever, what in your mind, what does that look like? Why, why is the Labrador king? Yeah. Versus a, a you know, a versatile breed. And, well, and trust I, me, I've I've drank the Kool Aid. Like, yeah. Before I started to see things, I thought a versatile dog was God's gift to duck hunting. Yeah. No, I, so, I, I get it. <clears throat> and it, and it, like a versatile dog can be God's gift to duck hunting, mm -hmm. but it's not guaranteed to be God's gift. And Correct. I don't know if this is true. Maybe Josh knows. I read somewhere in some book. I I do read once in a while that <laughs> the even the shape of the dog's eye. That they have a better marking ability than than the other breeds. Now I don't know what that means in rods and cones and everything, but their marking ability would just to be to me it would be the that's why you know they're they're they've been for hundreds of years they have been sitting and going to get you know they're they don't tend to hunt with their nose. I mean in, unless you hunt them an upland game they're hunting with their eyes they're how many people have seen a lab in a blind and in personal dogs too i mean they're like you're sitting there talking to your buddy and your dog's looking like 
I mean, they're like always on cue for Mark and everything. So uh, I think that that labs something with that labs eyes that just that, that they want it, you know, and and they can mark better. Yeah, I mean, when you really look at it, genetics are everything when it comes down to everything that we're talking about genetics, it, they are everything. And uh, you take a retriever that has been bred for generations upon generations upon generations for the, the tasks that Ron is talking about. That's why you develop that and you hone them in. You know, it's like if, if I, if, if all I ever did was haul my horse trailer, like why would I get anything except a one ton pickup? Right. Like I could try to get to a half ton and be like, well, like I could get better a few miles when I don't have it. When I do have it, I could still try to pull it. You know, I could still get there. Right. Like you could just get the, get the vehicle is going to get the job done. Right. And so that to me, that's why they're king. But the other reason that they're king is the reality of that. I would say, I would say over 99% of outdoors men and women, their dogs are family members first and hunting dogs second. And the Labrador fits that to an absolute T. They can be here. I literally have one laying right here at my side. You've never known he's here. He's quiet. He's calm. He's a great member of my family. But yet when I ask him to go turn it on and turn the jets on in the field, he's got it. Yeah. And there's just few breeds, especially when you're talking about specifically waterfall hunting, like you can't beat this, you know? And so that's that's it. The true specialist. It's a specialist. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. What else you got? What else I'm, you got? I'm just looking in the comments here, and I'm I'm seeing a few few people agreeing with the, the you know the marking ability, and I'm <laughs> seeing a, th- a few people throwing the BS flag. So it's interesting. There's well, except there's exceptions to every one of them. You read yeah. these questions. My last mm-hmm. lab was the worst dog ever. He wouldn't touch a duck. You know, like <laughs> it's funny watching these comments come in, but there's exceptions to every single. Yeah. every every dog out there i want to i want to say something Lori just put a comment in and Lori is a friend of mine uh she said how many dogs have you had as house dogs and they haven't all been house dogs but they've all been motel dogs so <laughs> you still have to have a good motel dog you don't want to wake up in the morning and find your boots eaten up and the bedspread shredded you know so yes i've had great hotel dogs <laughs> This is an interesting question I was thinking of asking, but you know, you, you take, you look at a, a, a pointing lab, for example. What's your what's your take on that? Like, in my opinion, you know, you've taught a dog to flush, and then now you have it pointing. Like, what does that look like? What are your thoughts? Ooh. Well, before Josh jumps in there, because I'd like to hear his. You know, you said you taught a dog to flush. And like Josh said earlier on, there's nothing better to see the instincts of a young pointing puppy, just point instinct. Correct me if I'm wrong, but every dog has a prey drive. And if every dog came from long, long history of wolves, coyote, whatever, wild, they all stalk their prey. So they've all got some type of slowing down and pointing. And even in the pointing dog world, that's where we introduce stop. Don't move, don't move your feet. So I think the labs are bringing that out. I mean, would I get a pointing lab? No, but I think every, honestly, I think you could teach my Yorkie to point if you taught her to walk. So I think it's in every dog. And I think that's the natural instincts that we just go, wow, it's there. And then it's what we do with it from there. Yeah. Can't argue, can't argue with that one. God, Greg and I agree a lot tonight. All Boy. right. Yeah, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. All right. Um, we've got a few minutes left here. We'll, we'll go and some answer oh, we go into overtime ben we have to go into overtime we'll, we'll answer we're going to answer some questions here so um let's see here mm, 
Oh, Josh, this is an interesting one. Can you give us a, somebody's looking for the breakdown on British versus American labs. I agree. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. 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 Yeah, for sure. So um, if you guys can give me a couple minutes, I won't take up a ton of time. I'll, I'll tell you why uh, I'm breeding British Labs right now. A kind of quick story. So uh, I I owned American Labradors, loved them, uh, American bred Labradors. So let's just first, before I get into the story, let's just break it down. They're both Labrador retrievers. Like there's, there's nothing that makes this a different breed or this a different breed. They're all Labrador retrievers. Okay. Um, what you're looking for is the different traits and how you, how you uh, are trying to get uh, you know, out of each dog. So I had American bred labs, loved them. And I'm very open about this as a trainer. Cause I was a trainer before a breeder. I was never going to breed unless I truly had a belief and a, a why of why I was going to breed a certain breed. Uh, I hated British labs hated them. And the reason I hated them was because uh, the dogs I'd see were for uh, lack of a better term slugs. They had no motor, no go, didn't have the drive. And as a trainer, you kind of want a dog with some drive, you know, so you can do something with them. Right. Um, so I, I just didn't like them. And so, as I said before in this, you can be prejudiced towards a certain breed, but if you see a good one, you're going to like them. Right. And so that's what happened to me. Found my first good one. I was like, Oh my gosh, I like this puppy. And then I saw another one and then I saw another one. So it took me three times. I've never claimed to be the sharpest tool in the shed. So it took me three times. So on the third puppy, I was like, okay, something is up here. So I called and talked to each owner. All three of these puppies came from the same breeder. So I called the breeder and I just talked to him. I said, look, like I'm, I'm open-minded about all this stuff. I want to learn as much as I can from everybody. So tell me what you're doing. Why are, why am I seeing something different out of your puppies than what I'm seeing when I normally talk about or hear or see British labs? So we had a big, long discussion. And um, as my wife uh, would tell you, I can't ever dip my toe into something I just have to go all in on. So I literally hung up the phone and I booked a trip overseas. I've never been out of the country. I've never, I have no idea where I'm going, what I'm doing, but I'm going to go see this thing firsthand. So I fly over to Scotland, land, I drive first off the death defying drive of being in the wrong side of the car on the wrong side of the road uh, was, was terrifying to say the least. But I get up to the north end of Scotland and uh, I'm at this trial and I'm watching these dogs and they're doing amazing things like big motors, big drive, like jumping fences, big blind retrieves, the whole nine yards. One of the things that stuck out, that was the first thing that stuck out to me. The second thing that stuck out to me was I was actually at the line, you know, carrying game because their, their field trials are on live hunts, which I love because these dogs have to actually hunt. They actually have to be in that moment. One dog might get a 10 yard retrieve stone dead. The next one might get a 300 yard sailor that they have to track and run that bird down. Really interesting. So I love that aspect of it. So uh, what I, one, one piece that made me go, wow, was I was standing there at the line and one dog yawned and like dogs do at the end of a yawn goes, Ew. and the judge looked at me and said, he's out. And I was like, for what? And he's like, he, the noise, he made a noise. And I'm thinking here, like I test and I, I like these dogs are like rah, 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 at the, at the line, right? Like for me as a duck hunter, I don't want to listen to that for five minutes, let alone five hours. Why are we allowing that to be acceptable? Okay. So I'm seeing a lot of these things I really like. So we go back to the hotel that night and I come out, I go up and shower, come downstairs and I come into the pub that was attached to this hotel. And I see all the handlers that were there at the trial and I'm looking down the line and I walk in the pub and I, as I turn the, the corner, all these dogs, I just watched big, powerful, doing everything that I didn't think a British lab was, are laying at the bar stools, calm and quiet and under control, laying at the bar stools in the pub, completely under control and quiet. I'm used to dogs burr, 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 pulling out of the, out of, of the test grounds or the trial grounds on a trailer, right? Like, this is not what I'm used to. So I, like, this is a life-changing moment for me. Cause I'm like, as we talked about before, like whether you hunt, like I hunted, I waterfall hunted 92 days last year, just waterfall hunted. That's not scouting, traveling, anything else. Okay. I do not want, I want a dog to go do all that big stuff, but I, I don't want a dog to sit here and whine and be vocal and be anxious and all this stuff. Right. So I, I sat down, I talked to these guys all night and as the liquor kind of started flowing, they were more and more open with me. And so my, my end of the story, so I don't make this too long, was I was sitting there with a guy that's a good friend of mine today. He's been to my house. I've been to his house. 
And uh, I worked up the courage to ask him what I want to ask him. So I said, Tommy, you, know, you got to clear something up for me, man, because what I am thinking of when I think of a British lab is this like, you hear about short and stocky and kind of square and these, you know, they're, they're great in the house, which was just not a nice way of saying they didn't have the motor, right? Like why, why did what I see today so different than what I'm used to back in the States? And he had a beer that was like twice the size of this. It was like this tall and he took a big drink of it and he put it down. He looked at me with a big grin. He goes, Josh, you really think we're sending our good dogs over there? And I was like, Oh my gosh. Okay. So I literally have spent the last, you know, whatever I said, nine years of my life with relationship building and getting the right dogs here. And these right dogs are like, even my friends that are, you know, they're, they're big trial guys or big test guys. They're anti British lab guys. If I go run with them, they're like, okay, that's different. Right. So, but it's all about genetics. It's, it's about finding what is the right fit for you. For me, the right fit is I want that dog to go do big things. Right. I want to do three, four, 500 yard blind retrieves and do it in style. But for me, they have to come home and sleep in bed with my four year old daughter at night. They have to have that side of them. And if they don't, they're not the right fit for me. And again, this is where I break my heart more times than not because I have to move on from dogs that aren't the right fit because I will not breed a dog that isn't the right dog as far as you know, it fits for me. So, and then that's beside that we could get into health testing, which is a huge part of this. We could get into so many things, but that's to me, that's the difference between you know the, the British dogs and what I'm looking for there. But they are Labrador retrievers. Like, like, let's not get that mixed up. I think too many people are jumping on the British lab bandwagon have never been over there. I've not spent time over there. Like it, they're a Labrador retriever, right? It's just the traits that you're looking for and how it fits into your family and how it fits into your life. Uh, ben, I, I raised my hand there because Josh mentioned something that I said early on. And I, I would like to ask everybody here what they think cooperation is. Mm. Cooperation in the dog to me is what you're describing. They they know when it's time to go. They know when it's not time to go. They don't drive. It's it's what's genetically in them to be what we call a good dog. It's like okay, all right. I, I it, cooperation. Is, it's on our scorecard in NAVDA, and it's in our scorecard in in the, in the federation. And I've always said it never gets a high enough point value for the math. Because that dog that cooperates with you, he kind of, I don't want to put, I don't want to anthropomorphize it, but it kind of understands you and it understands the situation. So a dog that, a dog, sh a good dog should understand it's, it's not time to hunt. It's time to go to the bar, so to speak, you know, or it's time to go lay down with the kids. And those really good dogs to me have a high level of I shouldn't say a high level. They have a balanced level of cooperation and desire. Yeah. I think cooperation, it gets, it doesn't, there's not enough of emphasis on that. A level headed cooperative dog. I mean, that starts at the stakeout chain when they're puppies, yeah. you can put them yeah. there and they learn to be calm. They learn to yeah. relax. It's like Josh hooking up your horse to the trailer and you got one pawn all the time. You need one just to be calm, be relaxed, cooperate. Okay, I'm here to do a job. I'm here to do this, level-headed. On the field trial circuit, you look at the horseback and the all-age guys, when they pull in with their $100,000 rigs and everything, and he's got these high-powered, high-powered rebel dogs that we all think about, they open the door to that dog box. They take that dog out. There's no jumping around, spinning around. That dog is almost like yawning. Okay, put me on a stake, sit there. And he sits down and watches until it's his turn. Yeah. He knows I'm out here to cooperate with my buddy. I've been through this routine. He's level-headed. Now you get some of those that aren't cooperative, runoffs, or are bouncing all over the place. Cooperation, however we say it, doesn't get enough emphasis, in my opinion, when it comes to breeding. I mean, and I see it. Yeah every every single event 100 percent, 100 percent agree ron I, I like that that cooperation side i'll tell you the the verbiage that i use for it and we're talking about the same thing is, is i call it team player so yeah. when i when i go through my checklist of things so when i bring a dog in from overseas i like to bring them in at a young age to where i get to finishing them and train them 
because I mean, I could bring in a finished dog that is four or five years old, but I can't tell you what was trained into that dog versus what was natural into that dog. You know, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of things that a trainer can train into a dog, make look pretty, but that puppy that that dog is going to produce is going to produce what was natural in him, not what was trained into him. Right. So like with my checklist, one of the things I have is team player. And the reason is, is that you can have a dog that's going to go do big, powerful things, but if he's a renegade, so like that short hair I talked about that when we would field trial and the judges would yell, thank you to end the brace. And he would literally kick it into another gear because he didn't want to be done. He was a renegade. Like he was, he was, he was fantastic at what he did, but he wanted to do it for him. He didn't care if you were there or not. He wanted to go do it for him. And for the vast majority of people, and I would actually say myself and probably all of us here included, we want a dog that is a team player that understands the game, that wants to do it with us, that wants to be successful with us because those dogs that are renegades, there are no fun for people. They're going to butt heads with them the whole time. It's going to be this, the, a major challenge. It's going to be pulling teeth all the time. It's just not worth it you know, for the majority of people. You do have a small percentage of people that want that. But for the vast majority of us, we want a team player. I mean, that's a big part of what we're looking for in any breed. Yep, yep I agree. Hey, before we get on, we're going to have one more question here. But just want to remind you, we're going to post a giveaway link here in, uh, in the chat right now. So be sure... <clears throat> To check that out, we're going to be giving away a subscription to Ron's Upland Institute and Josh's Retriever Roadmap. Um, so be sure to click that giveaway link in the chat here. Um, get the opportunity to learn both fantastic programs. I've watched them both. Um, so click to, to be sure to enter to win in that one. Um, so the, the last question I had, a little bit more, I guess, I don't know if you'd call it philosophical, but we had, a, I was just talking to a coworker today. Uh, his lab died after 12 years. And, you know, every time you hear that, it hits you because we love our dogs. You know, that's, that's why we're all here. We're all, we're all dog guys, all bird dog guys. So um, somebody asked this question. I thought it was perfect. As, as dog handlers, we teach our dogs the way of bird hunting. Um, what has a bird dog taught you about life? unconditional love i mean that sounds odd but i just put like i said i just put down an 11 and a half 12 year old setter and i've only had to put down two dogs in 25 years but at the end of his life i i basically said this dog doesn't owe me anything anymore he gave me everything he could he always wanted more he didn't care i mean it taught me unconditional love is kind of a flu flu movie kind of saying to say it but their their the commitment i mean he was committed to myself and what he had to do and, and it was tough and they they've they've taught me commitment mm. god it's such a deep That's, question i know uh re, 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 say that question again so i can absorb it then I sure can. So, uh, you know, we as as handlers, we teach our dogs the way of bird hunting. What has a dog taught you about life? I, I would say patience. It's taught me patience because there's even though they grow up way faster than our kids do, there's still those that training time from puppy to first season and second season you got to have patience and when you lose your patience you're kind of losing the whole focus of why we're out there so i think they've taught me some patience and just like yeah i that's it i guess that's the only word i can say it's taught me some patience to just give them time to grow and you know hope everything else is right with every you know training and the gene pool and everything else but it's patience this isn't a race it's a marathon it's a lifestyle and if you want to be in it you, you want to be happy and in in any job i don't care who you are or where you work if you don't have patience you're going to be the guy that nobody wants to work with so dogs have taught me patience i'll go next um loyalty and trust and you know i had a dog that was tough 
right out of the gate, but I trusted in that dog and what we were doing together. And I've seen that come back around now. Um, you know, so I think that's a big thing. And, I, and also I, I don't have the nearly the years of experience that Re, uh, Ron and Greg and Josh have to talk about all the different dogs, but just that loyalty. And then, you know, my dog wants to see what's on the other side of the next hill and to experience some of those things together is pretty remarkable because when you put yourself out there and you do go to the next hill and the next hill, you find some of the best things in life are over there. So the hard work just totally pays off. Yeah, that, that was great, Travis. I love that. Yeah, you guys have hit a lot of, of course, what I would normally talk about. So I'll kind of hit maybe something else. Um, I, I'd say living in the moment is one big one. You know, I think uh, I think we all get caught in the trap of thinking that that we have more time in life, you know, than than we have, and whether that's the way that a dog you know, you know treats each day as as you know you know almost as their last, right? They just love every part of it. Um, I think that that's a big a big deal. And then of course, when we do get to the end of that road, we all say the same thing: is that you know we we wish they could be here longer, right? I mean, that I know that'll be my first question to guy when I meet him is is you know what were you thinking there? Yeah, on that one, I'm sure he'll have a good reason for it. But um, yeah, another one that that I would have, yeah, I think forgiveness is a big one because I can tell you that I've made more mistakes with dogs, and I can count every single time they have forgiven me for it immediately, and I've been able to then you know make it right. And then, um, you know, one that I, I've really been talking about more and more all the time is you know, we always think about, you know, training our dogs and owning our dogs as being a leader. But I think they teach us as much of how to be true followers, you know, than anything. You know, if we truly watch them and we truly understand, you know, how they appreciate us and, and the selflessness that they have and how they, they handle our relationship, um, I think we can be, you know, we, we can be better people as a result of having our, our relationship with them. So uh, we just have to be able to open our eyes enough to see it. That's perfect, Josh. And, and to end, just think about your best or your best dog and the people that he's in or she's introduced you to. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I mean, true. Can I'll get everybody to shed a little tear here on my website. They, I actually made this quote. I did not steal this quote. And at the end of this thing, in parentheses, it says, for me, it's always been about the friends and the dogs that we know, the ones that have passed on, and the ones that we have yet to meet. And that's that's how I'll go out. It's going to go on my tombstone. <laughs> 100%. I love it. Well, guys, I, I really appreciate everyone here uh, that's that's watching. I appreciate all the panelists. Thank you guys for jumping on. And, you know, it's at the, at the end of the day, the moral of the story is finding the right dog for you. Uh, there is no best bird dog breed, nope. right? It, it, it's, nope. it's all about finding the best dog for you. So um, I'm glad that came through. And before we jump off here, everyone go through and pick your worst, your least favorite dog. Just kidding. We're not doing. We're not doing. <laughs> ben, Ben, can I mention something? I don't know if if people have ever done this when they think about which puppy to get, but can they go to a NAVDA event or go watch a variety of different dogs in their element before making the choice so they see what mm -hmm. options are out there? I mean, I, I just yeah. encourage people to do that. There are so many great dogs out there that people yeah. might not even realize because they haven't seen that dog in the field. Travis, hang on, hang on. And that's a perfect op for a TV show. We got one, two, three, four, five guys. We'll have <laughs> loose and we'll have bragging rights. We all, all release them in the same field and see what happens. Yeah. Uh, and uh, each year, each one of us gets to pick a different location. Ooh. All right. I like there you go, Greg. You better, you better. I got my hand up in my little window here. I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. Blood oh, of Timber of Arkansas. Yeah, I know, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bring my pointer famous Amos and I'll show you some things about marking. <laughs> oh. That, that's not gonna happen at all. I don't think he could even sit on a dog stand. <laughs> uh, but, Anyways, guys, uh, again, thank you all for coming. Um, actually, if, if you missed some of it, um, 
we'll have this available on YouTube, or if you want to listen to it, Ron will have it on the Hunting Dog podcast uh, in the next day or two, a week or two, Ron. Yep. So you can go back and listen to it. So again, thank you, everyone. Uh, have a good night and love on those dogs. Thanks, man. See you guys. Appreciate y'all. Take care, guys. Be good.